Continuing on on the island of Moita or Moitza, as we look at the Canaanite Phoenician city of Moita, the settlement there, Leviticus 18 and verse 21, we see the Israelites are told, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. So we see the Israelites were not to let any of their seed, their children, pass through the fire to Molech. Uh, that's al also another name for Baal. And Deuteronomy, they're warned there in chapter 12 and verse 31. Thou shalt not do unto the Lord thy God for every abomination to the Lord which he hates have they done unto their gods, for even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10, And there shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or that uses the di divination. Or So as we've seen, the northern part of the island uh, it was referred to as the Tophet, and the southern part of the island we referred to earlier as the Kofan. And that was a reflective pond to map the stars, which they were commanded, the Israelites, not to observe these things that they did. The Tophet, which is a Hebrew word, means place of burning, and it's taken from the Old Testament. And it was referred to where the Israelites uh, burnt their children with fire, picking up the, I, the practices of the Canaanites. And so what we want to do now is look here at this model of the Tophet that was excavated. And as we look here, this model is not to scale by any means, but gives a representation of the findings there. And just on the perimeter of the wall was found where you go into the Tophet area and you would come around this area there was a sacred well. Now, actually, they found a second well, which was older than this, and it was a freshwater well. And so here was the freshwater well, and it was actually a rectangular well, but this is for uh, purposes of illustration. Then there was a series of steps that the priest probably would have gone up. And then here is the area which is believed to be the burning area. Uh, they're hoping to find uh, some type of altar or uh, oven that might have been used in the sacrifice uh, of these offerings. And then from there, there is another series of steps that goes up here, and it was the Shrine of Baal. And both Baal and Ashtoreth were worshipped uh, in this area. And there would have been an image of Baal here between the two center posts. And the center posts are probably more rectangular than these round uh, posts here. And there were walls around this whole area. And we've got a representative wall here in the back. And I'm just going to remove that for a moment. And then you have these areas here of uh, these pit areas. And in these pits, there is, first of all, a, what is called a votive pit. And then there is a pit, uh, uh, this field of urns that is found. And uh, on that, there is also these big chunks of uh, rock carvings uh, in association with the urns. So the votive pit contained images of Baal, his head and likeness there, and then also of Ashtoreth and with uh, straight draped hair coming down, uh, the goddess of sexuality, the goddess of uh, rebirth, and uh, in other cultures, she's also a goddess of war, uh, Baal, the storm god and worshiped in all of the cultures. And they had holes uh, to hang these uh, votives that were in this pit here. And uh, hundreds of these were found 
and they're about the size of a little smaller than a volleyball. And they either hung from a pole uh, or possibly, and as we explained when we talked about olives, how they were sacred in the ancient world by the Greeks and other cultures, they may have even had a, an olive tree, a sacred olive tree uh, in the sanctuary, uh, but we don't know for sure. But that could be a possibility. So there is something that these things hung from, and it's not unlike looking at Christmas ornaments that we have today that hang from the trees. As we look here at the field of urns, uh, hundreds of these urns were discovered, and then these uh, blocks. And if you uh, see here in this particular one, uh, this is uh, one that I recreated that uh, shows the pillars coming down in an image of Baal in the center. And then uh, here we have an image of Ashtoreth draped, and this is an actual Canaanite uh, piece. This is an actual artifact, uh, her shrouded here. And she goes into other cultures, and we'll look at that uh, after we discuss this momentarily. And then also, this is an image. Uh, this was carved out of marble, this particular one, and I enhanced it by using charcoal so it could be visible a little bit better. But at the Louvre Museum in Paris, there is there a 16-foot carving that was taken, uh, found and discovered in Syria in the 1800s, and it's there at the Louvre, and uh, it's this exact carving there. And you see Baal with his mallet to strike the clouds. Uh, those are lightning bolts. And then the likeness of the king associated himself with the god Baal. Now, going back and talking about the urns and the field of urns, they didn't want to break open all of these urns, and so they, they waited. Some had been broken open and so they were able to see that they were full of ashes. And then they were able to use uh, more forensic methods to look inside of these urns and discover that these were the remains of children from 18 months old to two years old. And there would the, they found milk teeth uh, in these urns uh, with the ashes. And they are laid out in particular patterns, although they don't know what the patterns mean. And then on these big blocks that have uh, the likeness of this shrine here with Baal, on the bottom of those blocks, there would be uh, writing and that says something to the effect, uh, to the Lord God Baal, our offering unto him. And sometimes uh, they would list their names, but it would be the mother and father of the child. The child's name was never has not been listed on any they found. Now at Carthage in northern Africa, there is a field that is almost exactly like this. They have found fields like these in other places in Syria, uh, Lebanon. Uh, remember, uh, parts of Syria and Lebanon were Canaanite cities. These were places that the Israelites were to expel the Canaanites out of. God did not want his people uh, sacrificing these children to him or to any god. Baal is associated in other cultures uh, with Poseidon, uh, with Zeus. There's some blurred lines there, uh, but the... Uh, uh, the ways that they worshiped uh, are, are quite similar. Although most other cultures thought it an abomination themselves to sacrifice the children to an idol. Uh, he's also known as, uh, to, as Thor to the Norse people. Uh, and we're familiar with Thor from the uh, Marvel series of uh, movies. And that's where they based that from. Uh, Astereth, uh is known as Astarte. Uh, she's known as Ishtar by the Babylonians, which means star. She's known as Artemis by the Greeks. Uh, she is known as Diana to the Romans, to the Mesopotamians. She's known as Iana. And also it's where the word Easter originates from, uh, meaning star. So 
we see that she is a goddess of sexuality, of uh, fertility, and these two were associated with each other. Gideon was told to go down and chop down the pole uh, to Ashtoreth and to Baal there uh, in the book of Judges. Now, as we look and go through this, we look in 1 Kings in chapter 18. And we see there, there is, in verse 19, that uh, Elijah has gathered all of the prophets of Baal, which there were 450, and the prophets of the groves, Ashtoreth, 400. Now, a grove is not an Ashtoreth. The groves were for Ashtoreth. These sat at Jezebel at her table to eat. So she had 850 prophets to these two gods there in Israel, in Samaria. Uh, her husband, King Ahab. And we see that uh, Ahab even uh, sacrificed some of his children there uh, because of his wife's. Uh, and she was from Sidon, a Canaanite city or Phoenician. So they come together at Mount Carmel and the story there, uh, and uh, uh, Elisha kills those prophets. In 2 Kings uh, chapter 21, uh, we're coming down to the end of the, uh, just before the Judean captivity unto Babylon. In 2 Kings chapter 21, we see that Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He reared up altars for Baal and made a grove, as did Ahab, the king of Israel. He worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He built altars, graven images in the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And in verse 8 of 2 Kings 21, it says, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. And he says in verse 9 that he seduced them to do more evil than did, uh, than did the nations that were before them whom the Israelites were commanded to drive out. And so he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood as it states there, and that's as God sees it. And through the Holy Spirit speaking here. Manasseh, we know later in his life, repented. Uh, we see that uh, Josiah uh, tried to uh, uh, reform, but Josiah turned to God with all his heart and soul. And a verse uh, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 25 and verse 27, we see, notwithstanding, the Lord turn not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel and cast off the city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen and the house which I have said, my name shall be there. Because of the sins of Manasseh, God could not let that go unpunished. Even though Josiah had repented, turned to God with all his soul, it didn't happen in his days. But when they slid again, we see them going off into Babylonian captivity. Now, one might say, well, okay, well, that was in the Old Testament, and, and God settled those things, and, and God took care of that. If it is viewed by God, Man Manasseh's sin, that he filled Jerusalem from one end to the other with innocent blood, think of this statistic. Since Roe versus Wade in 1973 in this country, the United States, there have been over 59 million abortions. Will God let that go unpunished? Worldwide, since 1980, best estimates are close to 1.5 billion children have been aborted by their mothers. Some forcibly, some not forcibly, some 
not even for any part of worship, but because they just don't want the child. And you have to wonder how long God's patience will hold out. If God had the Canaanites and he wanted them exterminated so his people didn't pick up those practices, what will happen if we do not change our ways in this country and in this age? Thank you.